Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I know I'm standing between you and the beers, uh, so I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> um, I'm Philip. I'm from beautiful Vienna, where we have lots of fatty foods, uh, classical music, and beautiful women. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> one of our finest hours. Uh, uh, and I organize some meetups in Vienna, so one is ViennaDB, where we talk about databases, and the other one is more on the theoretical side, where we talk about theoretical papers. And I work for a B2B startup, where we do automated exchange of messages. So like, if you go to the supermarket to buy chocolate, at some point the supermarket registers, OK, we are running out of chocolate, and they will give us the order, and we'll make sure the chocolate uh, factory gets the order and then gets the chocolate back to the supermarket. Uh, so. Chocolate might not sound that fancy, but imagine it's beer. Uh, so if we fail, uh, you will run out of beer, which is not so good. Uh, and we use MongoDB heavily to do that. Uh, so who uses JPA? OK, a few. I, I can hardly see anything, but I see a few hands. OK, uh, who uses MongoDB? OK, also a few. Uh, who has at least heard of uh, Morphia? OK. Very few. <laughs> Just a few single hands waving. OK. Uh, so basically, Morphia uh, is like JPA for MongoDB, but it's better. And I will convince you. I mean, I, I, I'm not invested in the product. I just like it. I will, but I will, I will try to convince you that it's a better product uh, than basic uh, JPA. So if you're using JPA, who has used something like this? A two-way M2N join. Um, do you think this is OK? It's awesome. OK, yeah. So I know <laughs> I'm OK. Uh, so you're either in denial or it's the Stockholm Syndrome. Uh, so because I don't think this is OK. Uh, so what is the basic problem? Uh, relations versus objects. So you have your nice relations in the database. Uh, and you also have your nice objects in your code. But the two don't really match that well together. Uh, and then there is this famous saying uh, by Ted Neuert, who is incidentally also at the conference, which is very nice. Uh, ORM is the Vietnam of computer science, uh, and the post is a little older. It's nearly 10 years old, and it was, I think, just the start of Hibernate and everything. And back then, things were probably worse than they are today. Uh, but still, I think he has a point, because just the object orientation does not match to the relational database world that well. And as you will see, uh, MongoDB uh, does that much better. Uh, so let's talk about MongoDB. Uh, just to get uh, some terms right, uh, what has been a table in the relational world is now a collection. You don't have a schema. You just throw in your documents. So instead of rows, you just have independent JSON documents. And it's JSON because yeah, everybody is using JSON now for everything. Uh, so that's basically it. Uh, so Assume you have just a simple uh, JSON document, like the Philip document. Uh, I'm still alive. I'm 30. I've approximately that height. I'm from Vienna. I have an array of phone numbers. Uh, and I ha just have a mobile phone number, because yeah, landlines are dead. Uh, so you simply take this thing uh, and stick it into the database. And just to give you a short demo so that you can actually believe me that it's working like that. So we're connecting to our MongoDB database. Uh, by default, uh, we're connected to the test database. But let's say we use the, or let's, um, let's see. We don't have a Krakow database. Uh, the nice thing about MongoDB is uh, it will create everything for you implicitly. So if I just say I want to use the Krakow database now, I'm now connected to the Krakow database. And since I don't have a schema, I can simply start uh, throwing JSON into the database. So I can say DB, for example, we want to add a person. And we want, oops, we want to insert it. We want to insert a person, and we have a name, which is Philip. And let's say we have a phone number, which is an array, because you might have multiple ones. Uh, and this array is, I don't know, we have a type, is mobile. And the number then is, OK, so. 
As you can see, typing is probably not so nice because you're nearly breaking your fingers with, with all the braces you need. Um, so I think I've got them all closed now. Yes, uh, so the, uh, we can say the person we have just inserted, we want to find, and there it is again. And just to show you something a little more interesting, let's say my mom is a little more old school. Uh, she still has a landline. And my grandmother even has a fax which should be pretty much dead. So, okay, so we can say, give me all these three persons. So we have me, my mom, and my grandma. And now, just as we're putting in JSON, we can use JSON to get our data back out. Uh, so we can simply say, I want the person uh, with the name uh, Philip and it will find a person. And you can also do more fancy stuff. For example, if we want to get all the old people who still have a fax, we can say uh, phone, uh, the type is a fax, and then hopefully it will only find my grandmother right. So that's basically what you can do with MongoDB. So you just throw in your JSON documents and then you also use JSON to query it, which can be kind of a weird syntax, but it normally works pretty well and you can basically do everything you can and do in a relational database, you can also do in MongoDB. Okay, so this is all nice. Now, how do we get that into Java? Uh, because it's all nice if we can do it on the shell, but uh, Java. So uh, MongoDB, DB, the company behind the database, also provides its Java driver. And if you just want to add this document with the Java driver, it would look something like this. And when I told my colleagues, yeah, I found this nice thing, MongoDB, and we want to insert documents like that, uh, their reaction was something like this, because they, were, they said, okay, we, we, we are not really doing this basic DB object because if you want to nest something, you need to create another basic DB object and you need to stick them together and set everything explicitly. That's not really nice. That's not the way we want to work. Uh, so that's why we went to Morphia, which is uh, an ODM. So since you don't have the relations from the relational database and you only have documents, it's an object document mapping. Uh, but basically, it's the same thing an ORM would give you. So you have your POJOs and annotations, and then you can run your queries against it, and it will just work. Um, so the general features are it's pretty lightweight. Uh, it's type safe and type preserving. So everything you put in, you should just get out the same way. So you don't need to do any weird casts or anything. It should just work the way you would expect. Um, so what do you need to get this going? Uh, you need the uh, MongoDB Java driver, which is much like JDBC, which you would use in a relational database. And then you have your ODM, Morphia, on top of it. And finally, we have a 1.0 release. I think Morphia has been around for four years, five years, something like that. Uh, and only like three weeks ago, we had the first 1.0 release, even though many people have already been using it in production. And yeah. We've also been using it for three years or so with zero dot whatever. Uh, and if you search for the code, use the official uh, GitHub project. There's something on uh, Google code. Okay, that will go away anyway. And there's also a fork on GitHub. Uh, take the official one because only that's the most recent version. Uh, and if you want to uh, take a look at the actual code, because talk is always cheap, uh, show me the code. Just clone my GitHub repo uh, and you can just try out everything I'm showing you so you can get going. Uh, so basically what we are doing is we have yeah, some employees and connections and companies and how they work together and we'll structure some queries uh, and entities around that. Uh, and to run it yourself, uh, you just need Gradle, just clone the repo, uh, do Gradle test. If you have MongoDB, 
on the default port running, uh, the project will pick it up. Otherwise, it will download MongoDB for you and run it in an embedded fashion. So you don't have any external dependencies, just Gradle and the code, and you're good to go. OK, so let's start with the annotations on our entities. So at first, we have uh, the collection. So what was the table is now just on the class. We annotate the class to get our documents and get them into the database. Here we have, we call it company. By default, otherwise, it would be called company entity, but we just want to name it shortly company. Uh, disregard the class name stored for the moment. We'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, and then we have an object ID as the ID, and we need a no args constructor. So Morphia needs that to create uh, the entity. The constructor can be private or protected, but it needs to be there. Uh, otherwise, you will get a nasty error message. Do you have any idea why we need this uh, object ID and not a nice long? Yeah, OK, OK. We will come back to that in a moment. Uh, when, 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 he, when we insert it, we, we will come back to that. Uh, so some general tips of what you should not do. Uh, the first thing is uh, do not use dashes in the collection name. Uh, so we've done that. <laughs> and now we're stuck with it, basically, uh, because uh, the Java driver will nicely wrap that away. But do you have any idea why you shouldn't use dashes in the collection name given that the Mongo shell to access your data from the shell, the thing I've shown you before, uh, is based on JavaScript. <laughs> Do you have any idea? Does anyone know the uh, Gary Bernhardt's what talk? Yeah. About the, yeah, the what, where he just adds one, and then it's what one, 16 times in an array, and then he subtracts uh, one, and then what do you get? Yeah, right, exactly. Na, 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 Batman, because not a number. And that's exactly the same thing the MongoDB shell tries to do if you use a dash in the collection name. And you won't notice in the Java driver, because it just wraps it away, and you need to use some yeah, stupid syntax to get around it and work on the, on the shell with those things. So don't do that, uh, because once you started to do it and don't want to do a full refactor, it will stick with you for a long time. Uh, do not copy the value attribute. So in the value attribute, we said uh, we want to call our entity uh, just company. And at the beginning, I was at one point, I was kind of lazy, and I just copied my entity and just changed the stuff I wanted to change. But I forgot to change uh, the value as well. And since there is no schema, MongoDB won't complain. It will just put totally different entities into the same collection. So then you have your whatever persons and companies or whatever you have had, you will just have all of them in the same collection. Uh, because there's no schema, MongoDB has no chance of knowing that it's not the way you wanted to have it. Uh, and do not use strings as ID without a good reason, because if you use some kind of referencing, which we'll also see afterwards, uh, strange things might happen. Uh, OK, so that's all nice and fancy. Not much difference uh, to JPA so far. But let's take a look at uh, polymorphism. Uh, so assume we have a simple abstract-based class employee and have two specifications, uh, managers, which can approve funds, and workers. And the workers have experience. Uh, obviously, managers don't have any experience or don't need it or doesn't make any difference. Okay, but we have these two specifications, and we want to store them. So in relational databases, you would have three options, basically. Uh, you could either use a union table, where you just put everything into it, and then you would have null values. So the uh, managers wouldn't have the, the experience, and the workers couldn't approve funds, and they would just have null values. And the more specifications you have and the more attributes you have, uh, the more null values you will have in your database, which is not so nice. Uh, the second thing is you have concrete instances without common queries. So you would have uh, one table for managers and one table for workers. But how would you get all the employees back afterwards? So then you would just need to query the employees uh, and the managers, and your application would need to put them together to get all the employees of your company. Also not ideal. Uh, the third option would be you have a base table, uh, and then you have specific subtables only with the specific attributes uh, of all your uh, specifications. 
The bad thing is you will always need joins, which can be just handled somewhere in the background. You don't really need to care too much for it, but if you do need to make manual queries, it's quite uh, a burden. And also you always need to do the joins, which is also a bit more work for the database. So not so nice. Um, yes, but it's probably the feeling uh, for these options. So let's take the pain away. Uh, so what can we do? We simply uh, annotate our abstract base class employee uh, and say that's the employee and then we have these two specifications and there doesn't change anything in the specifications. And what you get in the database then, if you would store the specifications, is just this. Since you don't have a schema, you don't have null values because the attribute doesn't exist, it's just not there. You can do your common queries. You can just say, okay, give me all the employees. Uh, or you can also say, just give me the managers based on the class name. And here, we have said that the class name store, the no class name stored false. So basically, store the class name. Uh, because we want to be able to say, okay, this is a manager and this is a worker. You could also do this uh, based on the attributes it has. So if they're all different, uh, Morphia could figure it out on its own. But if you have something which just shares the same attributes, uh, Morphia wouldn't have a chance to make this distinction. So we always try to make that explicit. Uh, yes, and here we have the object ID again. So any ideas? So this object ID is really not nice. So in a relational database, you say, OK, I have customer 256. And somebody else knows, OK, this customer. Uh, with the object ID, you cannot really say it like that. Uh, but do you know why MongoDB insists on having such a strange ID? No, it's not a UUID. It's close, but it's not entirely UUID. Yes, exactly. So with a relational database, you need one single instance who generates these IDs and hands out the IDs. Uh, since uh, MongoDB doesn't want to have that bottleneck and wants to be easily distributed, uh, there is an algorithm based on that. So you will hash together the MAC address, the process ID, the timestamp, and everything. So you have uh, guaranteed unique IDs uh, per collection, even if they are generated. They're normally generated by the client, just to take some burden off the uh, server. Uh, but they're guaranteed to be unique, and you don't have this single bottleneck. Downside is you don't have um, nice IDs any longer. Uh, one thing uh, people often say, OK, but this class name, that's really stupid if I want to refactor my code. Uh, because if I just want to move the package around or if I want to rename my manager entity to something else, what do I do? Um, yeah, you basically you have two options. So if you change your code, uh, you need to do a, an update query just to change the class name you have stored, which is kind of a schema migration. I mean, yes, I know you don't have a schema. Uh, but you might still want to update it. Or you could just store a custom enumeration. So you just stick in your own enum into the, the entity, and then you know, OK, I can query on that and make the distinction based on that enum. And that probably won't change. OK, properties. So if we don't annotate the property, uh, it's just stored like that in the database. So we have first name, whatever, in the database. Uh, we have surname. Here, this is a nice feature. If you have had last name before and then refactored the code and called last name surname, uh, Morphia would go to the database and say, OK, do I have an attribute called surname? If yes, load it into the variable surname. If no, uh, check is there an attribute last name? If so, load it into surname. So this is kind of a schema uh, change. So you can just say, OK, it, previously it has been called like this. Uh, just get the value and load it there, but it will always store the, the thing when you persist the entity as surname then. Uh, then we have a Boolean approve something, uh, and you can also shorten uh, variables in the database. So our manager can approve hires, uh, is just called hire in the database, and the mapping will be done by Morphia. And yeah, chainable setters are also nice. Okay, so stuff you should remember to do. Uh, Trim property names. So like the, um, the manager can approve hires of hire. Uh, this is a good optimization. The problem is, at least with the current default storage engine, since there is no schema, uh, the full attribute name is stored in each document of the database, which is 
So this will need a lot of disk space, and it will also need a lot of memory. So it's quite a common pattern, because in your program you want to have nice speaking long variables, uh, just shorten them for the database uh, and optimize over that. Uh, however, there is a new uh, database uh, engine coming up, uh, which can do that for you, so there's no need for that in the future. So from the next version, probably uh, that's the default, and then this optimization is redundant. Uh, use object data types. Do you have an idea why you should probably use object data types? Any possible advantages? Sorry? Exactly. Primitives cannot have null values, uh, and only if something is null, uh, it won't be stored in the database. Otherwise, you would persist it as uh, with the default value. So if you want uh, an optional Boolean, use the object data type. If you want to have the, uh, a Boolean initialized to false, uh, just use the primitive. And if you don't set the value explicitly, it will just evaluate to false by default. Uh, and yeah, uh, chainable setters are kind of nice. Indexing. The nice thing is MongoDB is generally very similar to relational databases, also in terms of indexing. So it's just B trees again, and they just work the same. So you can add indexes. So for example, here we have uh, an index put on name which is uh, used on surname and then first name. So this index would help you with any query that looks only for surname or for the combination of first surname and then first name. So much like a phone book, you could search by, uh, for surname efficiently in the phone book, however, you couldn't uh, search efficiently for first name. So B trees like you're used to. And you can do uh, indexing with unique constraints. So for example, the email address needs to be unique. And the sparse false says there can only be a single value with a null email address. So uh, it is not sparse. So null values are also treated as unique. So a single one of them can be unique. Set sparse to true if you want to have be the email address uh, optional. Uh, one major optimization of MongoDB uh, is the locking. So in relational databases, you have kind of the pessimistic approach. You always assume something will go wrong. So as I assume something will go wrong, I will just try to avoid it. I will lock the row or the full table, depending on the operation I do. I will lock whatever I'm trying to change. And only after I'm done, I will give away the lock so somebody else can do the write. That guarantees me that I have no concurrent writes which will collide in some form. Uh, MongoDB kind of takes the opposite approach, where it says, I assume everything will go well. Um, so all of you can write. Uh, I don't have a lock, but uh, I will have a, a version. So in the document, uh, you can say, I want to have a version. So for example, after the second write, you would have version two. And then if you write back, the write will only succeed if the document still has version two. So you read a value, you read version two, and the update operation will only succeed if the document still is at version two. If somebody has else has written in between, the version would be three, four, five, whatever, your write uh, operation uh, would, would uh, fail, and you would get an exception, which you will need to handle yourself, unfortunately. Uh, but you will get an exception, and you won't uh, simply overwrite someone else. So here the approach is just, it will go right. Uh, nobody else will write this to the same document as me. Uh, but if it doesn't, I will just give you an exception, and you need to take care of that yourself. Sorry? That is a morphia feature. So all you need to do is uh, you simply uh, add the annotation version on a long. And then in your document, you will have this long number, one, and then each write operation is not simply just overwrite it, but actually it is then an update where it says only overwrite the document if the version number matches. But that's a Morphia feature. But many of the MongoDB drivers uh, provide that. Uh, so I think in Ruby and wherever you have the same feature. So the optimistic locking is kind of MongoDB's overall approach uh, to, to the concurrency issue, uh, but the drivers actually implement it, so it's not done on the database level, yes. Sorry? You, by default, uh, if you do, uh, okay, so 
so the logic is this. If you do a persist, or actually no, it's called a save. If you do a save uh, on a document, and the document you have loaded from the database has the object ID. If you write something with an object ID, uh, Morphia will go to the database and say, okay, somebody has this, or some document has this uh, object ID. If yes, just replace that document. So it's just, like in the rest uh, world, it would be just a put and not a patch. So you would really replace the whole thing. You can handcraft your update statements where you say, okay, I only want to uh, add this field, remove this field, or update this single field. But you will need to do that manually. Otherwise, it just take the full document and replace it based on the object ID. So that's the matching thing. If you don't have an object ID, you will get a new uh, document. Joins. Something you don't have in MongoDB. Uh, so what can you do instead? You will need to structure your documents differently. This is also the number one reason why people are unhappy with MongoDB, because their document structure doesn't reflect their needs, uh, which is both important for writes uh, and write performance and also for reads and read performance. So instead of joining, you have two approaches. You can either reference uh, an entity. This is just on the driver level again. So you would have, it's normally called dollar $db ref, and it will, would say, okay, in this collection, this object ID uh, that's referenced, and Morphia will eagerly fetch that when you fetch a document. So if you fetch a document, everything that is referenced from that document will be eagerly fetched as well. You can change the annotation and then it will be lazily fetched, so just when it's needed. Uh, but this is the referencing mechanism. It doesn't do any join or so, it's independent queries, but the driver will just get all the things for you. Uh, the other uh, approach is just to embed, so you just have a sub-document stuffed into the main document. So for example, here we have employees. Uh, employees and companies are probably things that just can be pretty independent and work on their own. However, bank connections pretty much uh, belong either to an employee or a company, so we just stick them into our employee uh, and the employee has this bank connection. So this would be the, the alternative to joining. Um, queries. Uh, save or absurd. So just as we said, uh, the save is the initial operation. The absurd is what is called, okay, just look, is, is it there? Otherwise, uh, if it's not there, create a new one. If it's there, just replace it. Uh, all you need to do is you can, yeah, I've just called it persist, whatever entity, uh, and then I do a save and return the ID. That's all there is to saving. Uh, reading is also pretty simple. So you have a fluent interface and you can just stick everything in there you need. So we say, okay, I want an employee entity, uh, the field email address equals the given email address and I just want to get one because in that case probably you have annotated the email address as unique. Otherwise, uh, if it's not unique, and the email address could be duplicated, you will still get a single uh, employee back. And it's normally the one you insert first, but it's not guaranteed. So if you expect uh, more than one uh, element to be returned, uh, don't simply do the get, uh, just use some other mechanism to be sure to get the right one if it makes a difference. Um, or to get all employees, you can simply say as list, and as you can see from the method signature, this will actually give you a list of employee entities. So it's type safe and type serving. You have stuffed in uh, employees and you will also get back your employees. Uh, or if you want to say we want to get all the managers from the example we've seen in the, uh, previously, uh, we simply say, okay, we want manager entities. Uh, we want to get all of them so we get a list. Uh, the thing is, since we've stored the class name, we can simply say field, class name, just get the name of the class and query over that. And Morphia will normally throw uh, a warning for you because it says, I don't know that field class name. You haven't, add, you haven't added that to your entity. I don't know what it is. Are you sure it's correct? And because the class name is just implicitly handled by Morphia itself, we need to tell the query, disable validation, don't throw this warning. I actually know this field exists and I want to query over it and I don't want to see the warnings for that. Uh, watch out, one common thing uh, that has been driving people crazy is 
Morphe uses equal and not equals, uh, trust your compiler, uh, it will warn you if you use the wrong one. Uh, and something which unfortunately, again, we have done wrong, uh, we didn't uh, uh, normalize fields in the database, so our email addresses are not normalized to lowercase, so we always need to use a regular expression to, to, to uh, match ignore case, uh, which is much less performant than if you would simply do a match. So if you can normalize your values, always normalize them before you store them in the database. Uh, and there are many, many more features. I'm sure you can figure them out on your app. So you can do regular expressions. You can say, does an attribute exist? Uh, does it not exist? Is some number greater than something? If you have an array, do you have at least one of the elements to give it? If you have an array, do you have all, or you can match over all the elements? Uh, you can do score, sort, skip, limit, just like in relational databases. So basically, all the queries you can do uh, in MySQL, for example, you could do uh, in MongoDB. Uh, and there are many, many more features. For example, what's nice is cap collections. Cap collections, there you can say, I simply want to use, I don't know, for example, 100 megabytes for some kind of log. And it's kind of written in a rotary fashion. So you have 100 megabytes. And once you've written the full 100 megabytes, the oldest value will be overwritten again. Uh, and it will just write and write and write and write and will always overwrite the oldest value. Uh, the downside is you cannot do updates uh, when the document grows because since this, it's at this, this specific position, uh, it would need to do, yeah, it just would need to increase the space and it doesn't work like that. If you want to update something, you will need to remove it explicitly uh, and then insert it at the end, unfortunately. You have GridFS which is a distributed file system by MongoDB. It's basically just MongoDB, and it will chunk your big files you put into the database into 256 kilobytes uh, chunks uh, and put them together on the fly. The thing is, this kind of splitting and putting them back together has kind of an overhead, so it is normally 10% slower than a regular file system access, and many people don't want to go that way. Uh, also, Keep in mind, uh, MongoDB documents are limited to 16 megabytes. So if a single document is bigger than 16 megabytes, you either need to split it up in some form, or you need to use GridFS if you just want to store big files. And the reasoning behind this by MongoDB is uh, if your query gets 16 megabytes or more of data, it will just take so long, the query will be so slow, you're doing something wrong. Basically, MongoDB tries to protect you from yourself. If that's always a good idea, it can be discussed. Previously, or like three or four years ago, the limit was four megabytes, and they've raised it to 16. Uh, if you recompiled MongoDB, you could change the limit, but it's probably not really a good idea. Then there is the aggregation framework, which is very powerful, and I think uh, MongoDB is the only NoSQL database that has something like it. Uh, it can do some aggregates uh, and all the fancy stuff you would expect from relational databases. And it's a so-called pipeline where you can simply have different steps, like, for example, you can do a match and then you uh, just aggregate something together uh, and then you do a match again and then you sort and then you limit. And you can all do these steps repeatedly and you can write very powerful queries. The only limitation is the input is limited to a single collection unfortunately. And one other nice feature is key locations are well supported. So Foursquare, the, the check-in thing where you could be the mayor of, I don't know, whatever place, uh, they have been using uh, MongoDB in the past uh, just for that feature. And like three or four years ago, they had a major outage because of a MongoDB problem because of that. But it has since been fixed. <laughs> People have been told. Okay, some patterns. Because so far, uh, that's all very nice. Uh, we've seen some base code. Uh, but some stuff that we figured out was very helpful for application, our applications. So we're using a base class normally. So we have simply an abstract base class where we say, OK, every document has an, uh, an, an object ID. Uh, everything has a creation and a change date. And we have the optimistic locking. Uh, so we have the version. We have the no args constructor like you, you need it. Uh, we just have getters for these fields since we don't want to set them. Uh, and then, yeah, we have a so-called pre-persist. So 
uh, right before this stuff is put into the database, the pre-persist method is called, so we can get actually the creation date of the entity and the last change date. And yeah, all our entities need to implement the toString. And then, because in the previous code I've shown you the save, we had a specific save method for employees and for companies, and that's not very reusable. So you would need to have a save for each of your documents, uh, your entities, uh, which is kind of stupid because it's just always the same. And here, thanks to the base entity, uh, we simply use uh, generics. So we can say, okay, we have something uh, which inherits from our base entity, and whatever it is, just save it. And we can also do generic counts and get based on the class uh, and the object ID or get all or whatever you want to do. Everything you can uh, manage with generics, uh, you simply need a single query or a single method just to implement that. No, this is custom code. I've written that myself. Oh, we, we just have, we call it a, a data store or something. And, and from that, uh, we, we provide these methods. Does it answer the question? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> great. Uh, but uh, if you want to see the specific code, just clone the GitHub repo and run it. And if you have questions, come to me or hit me up on Twitter. Uh, okay, converters. Uh, while uh, Morphia supports many different data types, it doesn't support all of them. So one of the most noteworthy exceptions is Big Decimal. So if you're working with uh, money, you should use Big Decimal. I hope you all do. And the, but unfortunately, they are not supported. Uh, so again, you have three options how you can store them. So the, the easiest one is you simply annotate uh, it as serialized. So it just will serialize the Java code into the database, which works. So you will get the right thing back. The only problem is you cannot efficiently uh, search it in the database since it's just a Java serialization. And yeah, no way to get everybody who earns more than, I don't know, 3,000 uh, euros a month. Uh, you simply cannot query that by hand from the database. You will always need your application. Yeah. The second one is kind of not so nice, I always call it the fuckly one, uh, because you simply say, okay, I have my big decimal salary, uh, and I just annotate it transient, so it won't be stored in the, in the database, and I have a string representation of that, that's a salary string, and with my pre-persist and post-load methods, I just mangle it from the big decimal to the string, or I just mangle it back from the string to uh, the the big decimal representation. So it's not much code, but you need to have that in every entity which you, where you want to use it in the pre-persist and post-load, and it's generally yeah, kind of a stupid boilerplate code you need to carry around. The much nicer option would be uh, to add a converter. So you simply say, I have a big decimal converter, code will come in a minute, and you can either annotate your uh, entities or you can also say when you set up the initial connection, you just register the big decimal converter. It will, will then figure out, okay, whenever I stumble over a big decimal, I, need, I know how to annotate or how to transform that, and it will just do whatever you had in your pre-persist and post-load, so you just need to do that or provide that for a single time, and it will work in the background. I think this has been somewhere in some test case in the official repository. I have no idea why they didn't add it uh, in general, but yeah. Everybody who uses Big Decimal just carries that around in their own code somewhere. Okay, if you want to see more code, um, people often ask, okay, there's spring data for MongoDB. Uh, is that any good? Um, I think the spring guys are just in the opposite room, so I shouldn't say any bad things. Um, so. I think it's pretty good. Uh, it's also very feature complete. It sometimes has even more features uh, than Morphia. Uh, the thing is, when we decided back, I don't know, three or four years ago, uh, Spring Data didn't look that stable, and we were not so much into this whole th Spring uh, data repository thing. But if you're into the Spring world and have data repositories and just like that approach, uh, it's more or less the same as Morphia, and it, I'm sure it works equally well. So just use that. Our other concern was that uh, Morphia is provided by MongoDB, the company behind the database, so it will always know, okay, they provide the database, they provide the Java driver, and they provide the mapper, so all comes from 
one single entity, so it should all work very well together. Uh, but the Spring guys are also good, doing a good job, so I think you can safely use that. Uh, for testing, what you can do, because at the moment, there is no real, uh, you cannot really stop MongoDB at the moment, really. So you will always need a real database for your unit tests, which will, yeah, make stuff slower, and many people really don't like it. So fake Mongo, Fongo, I think that's from Foursquare originally as well. They provided a custom stubbing or Java in-memory implementation of MongoDB. The problem is it's not feature complete, so we are not really trusting that entirely. Uh, but maybe it does everything you need, so you can speed up your unit tests with Fongo. And one, one other very nice thing is uh, Critter. It's from one of the Morphia developers. Uh, because so far, what we always had, what kind of bugged me is, uh, when you do a query, you had always the string hard-coded. So if you say we have uh, a bookmark and it should be equal to bookmark, we have all these strings uh, hard-coded. So what if we refactor that? You just won't notice. Uh, and the nice thing is with Critter, uh, it will, I think it's, it supports both Maven and Gradle at the moment. So it will just look at your entities, uh, generate uh, the criteria, uh, rules for you, and then you just have in your code uh, criteria dot bookmark uh, bookmark. So it's all nicely typed. And if you refactor uh, and this stuff breaks, uh, you will actually get a compiler warning and not just your unit tests picking it up that something has changed. So this will make sure, uh, yeah, if you refactor, you don't screw up. Yeah, and then always there's always the question: but is it fast? So is, is MongoDB fast? Is the Java driver fast? Is Morphia fast? And I have my favorite comic for that uh, is the intelligence test of cats uh, uh, and the squid. And I guess this really sums up the, the whole discussion because there are so many variables like, I don't know, does your data fit into memory? What are your access patterns? What is your read-write ratio? What are the number of concurrent users? Uh, how complex are your queries or documents? There are so many things. So I'm afraid I cannot give you a certain answer. You just need to write a prototype and try it out yourself. Um, yeah, sorry for that. Uh, so to sum up, uh, stuff you won't get. You don't have transactions. So if you write a single document uh, that's atomic, so either it's in the database or it's not in the database, but you don't have uh, multi-document transactions. So you simply cannot say, I want to write an employee and a company in one single transaction, and only if both of them go to the database, uh, I want them to be there. Otherwise, I both want them to not be there. Unfortunately, that's not possible. So either you can structure your documents in a different fashion, or you don't actually need transactions, uh, or you shouldn't use MongoDB. That's just the honest answer. And there are no joins. So if you would need to join stuff together, that's simply not available. So you unfortunately cannot do that. Um, stuff you will get is you will get pretty rapid development. So it's great for prototyping. Uh, replication and sharding on the database level is also very nice and easy. Uh, you don't have the impedance mismatch. Uh, thanks, Ted Newitt, for that. Uh, and you will get relatively rich documents. So overall, uh, our developers or my colleagues uh, are happy uh, and they love Morphia. Uh, even the minions love Morphia. Uh, so I still got 16 minutes. So I think I skipped the thank you slide and we'll just get some little code examples. Uh, so one uh, common thing people often request is but I still need uh, these auto increments. So if they don't, if they're not provided by the database, how can I get my auto increments? So I want to have my users like one, two, three, four, whatever. Can I implement it in some fashion? Um, and our approach was so we have a so-called auto increment entity uh, where we keep the the counters basically. Uh, and this can either be on a class level or on a subset of a class level, which we will see in the example later. Uh, and when we do a persist, first we get the next auto increment value, then we set it uh, to the entity which we want to persist. Uh, and that's basically it. 
and we set the value in the target entity. So what we have is we have an entity called yeah, IDs or whatever. Uh, we don't need a class name here. Uh, we have just a value and a key. And maybe you remember I said you shouldn't use strings for the IDs unless you know what you're doing. Uh, in this example, we know we don't use, need any object IDs. We simply need uh, a key uh, that is always indexed. IDs are always indexed, so that's why we're using it like that here. Uh, and then, yeah, we have our constructor. You can provide a specific key, and you also can provide a start value, because at least at our company, it's always, oh, yeah, we don't want to have a customer five or so. People th should think we're big. We need to initialize customers, like, I don't know, with 10,000. So if you're cu customer 10,005, you think, okay, many other people are using it. It's good to go. Yeah, it's, it's much better. Um, so here, in this example, uh, we want to count employees, but per company. So you, we have different companies uh, and their employees, and we want to count the employees per company. So for one, exam for one company, you would have the employees one, two, three, four, whatever. And for the next company, you would also have one, two, three, whatever. Or actually, I think we're initializing at 1,000, but yeah. Oh yeah, so we start 1,000 counting. Uh, so what we need is we have a generate auto increment, and we say, okay, for the company class uh, and the company ID, because that's uh, definitely unique, uh, we want to start counting at 1,000. So this we will call whenever we save uh, uh, an employee, and the return value is the current employee number for this company, so the first employee of the company will have 1,000, the next 1,001, et cetera. And all you need then is just a simple the generate auto increment method where we say, okay, we, we want to get our auto increment entity and our field ID is just the key, which we've defined. So this would be uh, company dash and the object ID of the company. And for that company, uh, we want to increment the value, so the current counter. And we simply do that in a simple query. So uh, increment the value and get it back. In the end, we just return that incremented value and can set it for uh, the employee. It's not atomic, uh, but at least for us, it's good enough. One other thing that's sometimes useful is uh, document TTL. So if you want to say we have some kind of caching, for example, for us it's like if we get duplicate messages of our clients, uh, we just want to process the first one and the duplicates uh, we just want to discard. Uh, so we have uh, a collection where we store the, the, the messages for three hours and luckily there is simply an annotation, so you, we simply have this duplicate uh, collection where we have a creation date, which is the current date, and in three hours from now, uh, the entries will be removed. Simple as that. So after that, if, if we get a duplicate, uh, we don't care and we will just process it a second time. But like that, uh, the whole document will be removed after three hours. So there is like an internal cron job which runs every second. Uh, it's not guaranteed to be uh, exactly after three hours, but after three hours or just a little bit more uh, the, the document will be removed. Okay, and now I guess that's it. Any questions before you have your beers? Do you use the yes, we use references quite heavily uh, for, because... Okay, so uh, the thing is, uh, we use references, uh, but we think first before we use them. Because if you could build a huge structure where you just have something references something, and especially you can also do uh, a list with references. So one document would reference 10 other documents, and then when you query that one document, you would first query that one, and then you would have 10 queries for the, the reference documents. This is expensive, so we always think about uh, what would the queries afterwards look like. So I always do a code review uh, when somebody changes something on the entities, and we always look, okay, do we really need that uh, reference? Does it make our code easier? And what is the impact on the database? 
if you just fetch one innocent document and then you would get uh, 100 queries afterwards because of that, we don't do it. Then we just uh, put in the UUID manually and manually query it just on demand. Uh, but for other stuff where it's no problem, we just use the reference because it's more convenient. It's just loaded by default. We don't need to do anything. And for that's mostly stuff we can cache anyway easily, so, so there is no problem. But yes, it can be a problem if you don't plan ahead. Any more questions? Yes, so um, if you look here, so the, the update, that's, that's atomic. So you, you simply uh, define your, uh, your, uh, the, query, the query, just the defined thing, and then the update is just the update operation. So that's just a single operation. Yeah, that's, that's defined, it's the select, and then the update. And it's just, you simply call it uh, the find and modify. That's just a single operation. So you basically say, I want to get everything that has this uh, key and increment the value by one. And you could do that for multiple values. So they would be independent, but just the find and modify, that's single operation in a database. Any more questions? Yes? Uh, no, I don't think yet. It's still uh, uh, in the making. Uh, quite a lot of the features, so like full text search and, and other stuff has been added, but I n generally have the feeling that GridFS is not so popular, also probably because of the additional overhead. And Sorry? You use it, oh. How is it going? Okay, because your documents are too big or you have binaries? You have binaries, okay. Yeah, I always get the feeling at least, okay, we are on Amazon, so everything binary we just store on S3 and we don't care too much for it, and it's just cheaper and more scalable. And I'm always a bit careful because uh, it makes backups harder. So how do you do backups? Is it just not that big or do you just back up specific collections? Because I always try to keep the really big stuff out of the, of the database just to be able to uh, dump and restore databases relatively quickly. Okay, just a few. Okay, if it's just a few, uh, I guess performance won't be the problem, but no. As far as I know, uh, GridFS is not yet supported. I think there was a patch or something. Uh, but no, it's also one of the reasons probably why we've never bothered using it. So, but you can always fall back to the standard Java driver and that supports GridFS. It's not so nice, but it should work. Any more questions? No? Okay, I guess it's bureau clock. Thanks. Yeah.